So next, I'd like to introduce Nils Lundquist, uh, who's one of our senior consultants at Batovi. Uh, over the last 10 years, he's worked on a variety of uh, different projects, uh, ranging from back end to uh, front end and large web applications. Uh, today, he's going to show us how uh, Docker and its CLI tools can substantially improve our de development workflow. Hi, this is my presentation about uh, Docker for front end development. I'm going to try to answer why Docker isn't just for DevOps and back end guys and why front end developers should be considering using it. Uh, to start with, we really need to answer what is Docker. Oh. Uh, and we're just going to talk about a simple definition. It's a tool for building and running container-based environments. And that begs the question, what is a container? Uh, and how is it any different than a VM? So a container is an, essentially an OS that runs on top of your existing OS, rather than a virtual machine, which actually emulates a computer architecture on top of your OS. This means that they consume fewer resources than a VM, but like a VM, they use an isolated file system. You can still share files by uh, mounting volumes from the host or between containers, uh, but that's gonna sum up our definition, just really straightforward. It's for running these types of container environments. Uh, and now we can start talking about why you should use Docker in development. To start with, uh, it makes onboarding new team members a lot easier. Because Docker runs these container-based environments from shareable images and you can build them from scripts, uh, a new team member can get a dev environment working in minutes. Uh, on a previous client, they uh, didn't have usable mock services. Uh, their backend was a distributed system that required a minimum of six running processes to operate. They, they needed outdated versions of Python and Node. So, uh, to run this in my host environment, I need to downgrade my node. I'd have to use a Python virtual environment. I'd have to run all these processes manually just to get work done on the front end. Uh, it took the better part of a day for a new dev to get their environment configured and up and running. But after they switched to Docker, it took less than 20 minutes. Uh, by the same token, an existing dev can delete and rebuild their environment in minutes, undoing any experimental changes they might have had. Um, instead of having to track all those and undo them all by hand uh, when they want to go back to like, a standardized environment. And while like, this fast onboarding is great, there is like, another big feature that I think is like, even more important, and that's consistency. Uh, consistency between team members, so you basically reduce the number of times you hear or you end up saying, well, this works on my machine. Um, you can use an environment between all of you that's consistent. Chances are you'll get much more consistent results. Um, another good reason is using an environment that's closer to what production runs uh, compared to like a mock service. On the client I just mentioned, uh, another developer had told me that their code worked on their machine. Uh, it was using their host environment to run the application. I asked them to try to boot up the Docker environment and reproduce the error there. Within a few minutes, they had the error reproduced and they realized, oh, I have had some changes I forgot about in my database and that was masking the issue. So uh, actually, there's another uh, issue I can think of. Uh, on another client, there was a difference in uh, file name case sensitivity between OS X and uh, Linux, or Mac OS these days, and Linux. Uh, and that was at the root of another issue. It took us a while to figure out that that's what it was. If we had been using something closer to the production environment, the production Linux environment, we would have noticed that problem a lot sooner. Another convenient uh, feature is isolated dependencies. So uh, your dependencies stay within the containerized environment or within the volumes attached to those containerized environments. So you don't have all of these dependencies littering your host environment. It's a nice clean separation. Makes it really easy when you roll off of a project, you can just wipe those away uh, with like one or two commands. It's really great. Um, another convenient feature is a declarative environment. Instead of having a readme file that dictates like all of the different like environment variables you have to have set, uh, what OS packages you need to have installed, it can just be in a, like a straightforward script. You can see it all in one place, edit it just as easily. Uh, another feature that I like is being able to refute that an error is in the front end. As front end developers, I'm sure we're all used to taking the flack for some bug that arose, and it's immediately it seems like it's a bug in the front end. So when you're running your own backend and you've run into a bug like this, it's a lot easier for you to get access to the logs from the backend to maybe even take a look at the backend code and point out, well, I've seen these logs, I've seen this code, it actually looks like this is the problem. 
So you don't have as much he said, she said between the front end and the back end team. You can come to them with some evidence and show it a lot easier. Uh, another convenient feature is collated logs. If you're working on a system that has inner process communication or inner service communication, uh, it can be a pain to dig through the log files from multiple services, um, figure out what timestamps are matching up and like where the data was flowing back and forth. Uh, Docker can do its own log handling and produce collated logs for a couple containers for the whole, the whole architecture. And you can see that in one space, filter it easily, makes it a lot easier to look through these kind of complex logging situations. Um, some of these points, you that last point in particular, was rather backend focused. So you might be thinking that is Docker really for front end devs? You might say, I, I don't need a local dev backend because we have mock services, or my client has already shared a uh, has a shared testing backend that me and the other developers are using. But in my own experience, I've never had a client that has had mock services that are that good or a shared testing backend whose state was consistent. Uh, sometimes the, the client doesn't want to share a like comprehensive detailed environment with you for security reasons. They don't want to see, let you see the actual data that you're working with. Um, so you don't you end up with these kind of mock services that don't really reflect the actual system. Relatedly, like sometimes those mock services are just inaccurate or they're missing some services because you're working on two different code base. You have to maintain the mock services and you have to maintain the actual backend. Uh, and sometimes you have a testing environment that's shared with QA or shared with so many other devs that its state just isn't consistent. It's changing all the time. So you're not able to get consistent testing results out of this test backend because it's always fluctuating due to all the users using it. Uh, and even if you have a good testing backends, you can still run into issues in your front end development because of the environment that you're working in. I'm sure we've all had problems where like your version of Node on your host machine doesn't end up matching what the, the application expects. Sometimes it's, it's readily obvious. Sometimes it takes a while for you to figure out, oh, this was because I'm running a different version of Node. And like I mentioned on the last slide, OS effects can come into play that uh, file name case sensitivity, um, OS X is case insensitive by default, Linux is case sensitive by default. We had one accidental camel case in a module import that was causing our test to fail and it took a while for us to figure that out. If we'd just been using a Linux environment for development, we had this convenient Docker image to do that, it would have made things a lot smoother. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you a little bit that Docker could help your workflow and now you're asking, what do I need to know to get started? And the basics of building these containers is done with Docker files. And uh, Docker files uh, define an image for containers to be built from. Images are like essentially the templates for the actual functioning environments, which are the containers. And uh, Docker files specify uh, the base image and that's uh, the OS that you're working off of and maybe some applications that are bundled with that OS and that's what you wanna base your uh, development image off of. And you'll customize that by applying some actions to the base image. That'll be things like the default application to run, uh, or sorry, excuse me, there'll be things like the environment variables or the uh, console commands that you're running to install packages or otherwise modify the environment or copying files from the uh, host system into the image so that you can just embed your source code directly in there or some other utility that you need to have bundled into the image. Uh, Docker files can also configure the default behavior of the container when it's running. So things like the application to run when you start up the container, um, mount points for various volumes, or the ports to expose to other containers or the host. Uh, and so even though you can define these runtime parameters as part of a Docker file, I personally prefer to keep the, my images all about the state of the environment. Uh, instead, I define my runtime parameters using another tool that we'll talk about in a second. But first, let's talk about uh, Docker files. Let's take a quick look at one. So in this case, uh, I'm building a Docker file from the latest Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu image available uh, in the Docker repository, the global Docker repository. Uh, I've tagged myself as the author in it, 
I've updated the OS package manager, installing a couple uh, dependencies, uh, like OS dependencies. I'm installing a Python dependency. I'm adding some source code, and I'm saying where the container should boot into, into the home directory. It's a very simple case. Uh, now we'll go over to talking about that tool that I mentioned earlier. So this tool, Docker Compose, is the CLI that runs containers based on a runtime configuration. And a container with a runtime configuration is referred to as a service. And uh, services are defined in a Docker Compose YAML file. Uh, YAML is actually really good for this because it has built-in operators to do inheritance from other parts of the document. So it's really easy to template out related services. You can define one service and then kind of template the options you've configured in that service into other ones. So if you're running a bunch of like related worker processes or something, you can make that really easy to uh, declare in these files. So the Docker Compose configuration method also has full control over your runtime parameters. Uh, Docker files are mostly intended to be distributable. So they don't offer you full control over the runtime because some parts of your runtime configuration might be dependent on the, the host environment that you're running it in. So some of the things that Docker Compose offers is like what services are dependencies of another service. Uh, we'll see that in the example. And it's really just, uh, I have a web server that requires a caching layer, that requires a database. When I start up my web server, make sure those services are already started. Um, you can also specify what host folders get mounted into the service. So that's saying where your source is on your host and actually mapping that directory into your container so you can share your source seamlessly with the, uh, the environment that you want to run it in. Uh, it also lets you define the amount of logs to keep for a service. I mentioned earlier that Docker can do logging for you. And you probably want to limit your logs uh, just so you don't end up with storing way more than you need. And you can also set the working directory and the default command when you run that container. Um, let's take a look at what the Docker Compose files look like. So this version here uh, is using the third version of the Docker Compose uh, format. And we're defining two services. One's a database, just using the default Postgres image. We're not going to configure that at all. And we're having another service that we're building from a Docker file in our current directory. So that's going to uh, build an image from the Docker file in the current directory. Uh, and then when that image is eventually started up, it's going to run the command there, which is just going to start a Python web server. We're going to say that this web server depends on the database, so that will get started up before this service gets started up. And uh, we're also going to define a volume. We're going to map the current directory on the host, where this Docker Compose file lives, uh, to the code directory in the container, so that we're actually putting our source code, uh, it's a two-way binding, right, into the uh, container that we're going to run. And then we're also going to map a port so we can see that server on our host machine and use it as if it was running on the host machine. So that brings me to the end of my content. There's a lot more to go over. Uh, I'd recommend taking a look at the Docker Compose stuff uh, because that's a little bit more practical. It's more just about the running of containers. I think that's more useful for a developer. Uh, whereas the Docker documentation itself and the uh, Docker Getting Started Guide go into a lot more features, a lot more sort of uh, DevOps use cases which may not be as applicable for your average dev. But I still recommend taking a look at these if you're interested. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Nils. Um, I, I'll get us started with a question. Um, so you've basically sold me that I, I, need to, uh, uh, I need to check out Docker and look into this more. Um, but I'm curious to know, what are the gotchas? What, what's, what's been... Um, like, what are the things that you've found that you kind of have to be mindful of or make sure that you, like, are wary of or set up correctly or that sort of thing? Um, so one major gotcha is, like, when you're putting, for Node projects at least, when you're putting your whole source code directory into the container, uh, you're sharing that whole directory, right? So when you install your Node modules, those are actually going to end up getting written to your host mach machine, so you're kind of breaking that separation of dependencies. So what you can do is you can uh, share that host directory and then specify that uh, a like subdirectory of it. So you'll specify your node module subdirectory is actually being a volume 
So you'll share everything but that subdirectory. So that ends up being contained into a volume as opposed to getting written back to the host machine. That's, that's one gotcha. Um, other than that, I don't ever run into a whole lot. I think it works great. I, I, the CLIs are very easy to use, really like self-documenting, like very like uh, good user experience on the CLIs. Um, yeah, I, I, I haven't run into a lot of problems with this lifecycle once you kind of get used to it. So. Let's go. Cool. Anyone else have any other questions for Nils? Where do people store images? So seeing as that's a dependency of the project, uh, like if it's something that's downloaded, like if you're, if you're using images as a dependency and they're downloaded dynamically, uh, you can download that during the building of your image and bundle it right in. But if you wanna have that as part of your source code, you would just share it as part of that volume that gets shared. So it depends on where you wanna store it, in the source code directory or as part of the operating system image.